Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. It's great to see such a full room, especially in August. Welcome to City Club. My name is Linda Orsoletto. I am this year's board president. We could not be here today without our sponsors, so I want to recognize them. They um, not only support us financially, but also offer endorsements for us. So they help um, cover our day-to-day -day costs, this venue, AV, that type of thing. So just letting you know that we really appreciate your membership, but we could not um, do it without our sponsors. And our sponsors, our gold sponsors are ASI Wealth Management, the City of Bend, COCC, OSU Cascades, St. Charles, Pacific Source, Central Oregon Association of Realtors, and Brooks Resources. There is a much longer list on the City Club's website, and if you want to add your name to the list, you can talk to any of the City Club board members or Kim. And Kim disappeared, otherwise, I'm, oh, there she is, sitting in the back. She shouldn't be in the back, though. So, as I was talking about, we really appreciate your membership. So if I could have all of our new members please stand. No new members? Come on. Are you shy? What about members of City Club? Or just raise your hand. That's awesome. Great. Thank you so much for that. And if you would like to become a board, a excuse me, a member, you can stop off at the registration table for more information. And as we're planning this month's forum, our programs committee really got a hand view of how deeply emotional this topic really is. And that's what City Club is really trying to do, is to bring um, topics that are interesting to our community, maybe a little bit of uh, controversy, but the main thing is to promote conversation. And so it will be very touching, um, it will be very emotional, and all of the panel members bring their own perspectives. And we just really want to dig into this issue. So we just ask that everybody have an open mind while we're talking about this today, and I know you will. And along that line, we are always looking for volunteers for our programs committee as well. So moderating, moderating today's forum is Taylor Bailey. She is with the Bulletin. She is the Projects and Investigative Reporter. She's experienced in multimedia journalism, covering adventure sports, our environment, and social justice issues. She likes to have fun, too. She enjoys skiing and landscape photography. Please welcome Taylor.
Students who are suspended are more likely to develop substance abuse disorders and encounter the criminal justice system and are less likely to complete uh, high school and less likely to pursue higher education. From 2017 to 2018, federal and local data shows that over 2.5 million students across the country um, have received an out-of-school suspension and over 100,000 students uh, were expelled. Um, nearly a decade ago in Oregon, lawmakers uh, directed schools to amend their written discipline policies in an effort to rein in these high rates of suspensions and um, expulsions. These laws saw short-lived success but were later deemed ineffective. So what are the policies that some schools are using to address this issue? Um, it's kind of a catch-all term known as preventative discipline, and there are so many different approaches to preventative discipline. Uh, but most, if not all, programs focus on the alleviating and underlying issues that contribute to student misbehavior. Um, they also emphasize the importance between trust and communication between students and teachers. And, um, it's really cool. Uh, one program that I highlighted in the recording uh, was Ben McClyde's Upshift program, which is uh, a program in which students who are caught smoking on campus are able to either take uh, one day to three day suspension, or um, they're able to participate in Upshift, which is a smoking awareness course. Um, we got some data back from the district, and it's, it's really positive. So what are there we go, perfect. Um, so what are the, com, some of the uh, common threads among a lot of these programs? Um, one of the programs that we're going to be discussing today is something known as restorative justice. It centers on, um, it usually involves a teacher and um, a group of students, one student who have, might, might have caused some harm, and um, together a teacher will lead a conversation to try to resolve that conflict between students. Um, they're encouraged to learn about how that student was impacted, and together they try to uh, make amends. Um, so it's really highly centered on conflict resolution and accountability. It prioritizes emotional development skills. A lot of children, especially young children, uh, lost several year, years um, due to the isolation brought about by the pandemic. Um, so it focuses on social awareness and relationship building skills. Um, a lot of these programs, like I said earlier, emphasize trust, the need for equity, because students of color, like I said earlier, students of color and students with disabilities are uh, disproportionately impacted by these policies, and the need for communication between uh, students and teachers. So, I think I'll take a, a few moments to introduce our panelists who are all very excited to be here today. So Sonia Little Deer Evans is a Deputy Director of Deschutes County Juvenile Community Justice, having worked in Oregon's juvenile justice field for 25 years. Sonia also trains and speaks at the local, state, and national level um, to entities ranging from nonprofits to juvenile justice education to health systems, and child welfare to private businesses. Sonia has lived through and understands the structural barriers that create disproportionate access um, to systems that perpetuate systematic oppression and centers this um, work towards systems change. Um, she creates nurturing environments and using power and privilege to provide equitable access to all. Sonia earned her BA degree in political science at the University of Oregon and her master's degree of public administration from the Portland State University. Eric Powell started his career in public education um, on the island of Kauai as a school counselor and after school and summer program coordinator for six years. He has spent the past 11 school years in Ben Lapine schools as a school counselor Dean of Students and Administrator before beginning his current role um, with the district as uh, the Assistant Director of Student Services. 
Eric and his wife, Kina, have three wonderful children who all attend Denla Fine Schools. And last but not least, we have um, Dr. Lucy L. Ferguson. She is an assistant professor of counseling at OSU Cascades uh, with licenses and certifications as a school counselor and approved clinical su supervisor. She has taught and supervised graduate counseling students for 10 years. She has five years prior experience as a school counselor and her research centers on recognizing and harnessing the cultural strengths of students and their families. She has presented and published widely, notably addressing school counselor mental health advocacy um, at events such as the American School Counselor Association Conference. Let's give a round of applause for our panelists. being an educator in our schools is to be one of the most difficult jobs out there and, and has the potential to be one of the most rewarding. Um, I know we have current working teachers and teacher candidates and school counselor candidates, so just want to thank you for your work and service. Um, over this past year, uh, we engaged as a district office team in some listening sessions, classroom observation, and then we formed a task force to kind of talk about these disruptions and these behaviors we were seeing in school. Um, the number one topic that came up was uh, that teachers were talking about students were being more and more dysregulated than they had seen in the past. Um, to, to quickly, yeah. Do you mind defining uh, dysregulation? Yes, for? thank okay. you very much. So, um, so dysregulation, kind of viewed as regulated versus the opposite of regulated would be dysregulated. Um, if an elementary school teacher, for example, is lining her class up uh, to go to recess, uh, maybe there's a predictable line leader that day. Um, a regulated student who may want to be the line leader might go up to the front of the line trying to kind of you know, get, get their place in line that's not their turn. They may be disappointed when the teacher tells them no. Maybe they'll even tear up, but they're able to kind of regulate their emotions, calm down, and get back in line. Um, a student that's maybe experiencing dysregulation, uh, they may be really frustrated. They may you know, say bad words. They may yell at their teacher. They could even run out of the classroom and be so frustrated. Um, they are maybe showing us that they're not able to regulate or calm themselves down in that situation. Um, and so what our teachers and, and through those listening sessions, what we heard over and over is that the number of students experiencing dysregulation um, is going up for maybe years past. Um, and you know, there's a lot of underlying issues that could be a part of that, right? Students experiencing trauma at home may have more and more difficulty regulating when they come to school. Um, students may be navigating a disability and it's up to us to partner with them, the families to help them gain skills, right? Um, so, so that's kind of the, the primary thing we were hearing. You referenced this earlier when you talked about upshift, but we're still seeing students over and over again come to schools addicted to substances, using vaping devices in bathrooms, and um, that's really impacting students on so many levels from the public health sector too. And we partner with Deschutes County and um, our team back there to try to work on that. Um, so that's another issue we're seeing. Uh, and then finally, um, for our high school folks, um, they've been talking over and over. Um, some students are just choosing not to attend school. We have a grad coach who I saw, Steve Weatherall. He works to help bring kids back into Ben High, get them across the finish line to graduate. Um, and so we're just having students maybe not prioritize their education like in years past. So. Um, I really like uh, the term dysregulation because it kind of steps away from this, you know, assigning a student is good or a student is bad. Um, it's because, I mean, we all get frustrated and, and dysregulated sometimes. You would be right now being nervous for dysregulation. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so Lucy, you specialize in this age group. What are some of the mental health challenges they face and why? Um, and what are some of the mental health services that are in Thank you, Taylor. I think one thing that comes to my mind too, um, I see my students out there, which is always great, they help regulate me, um, is that 
the students that we're talking about, our K-12 students, aren't really in this room. So often it's adults having conversations about what they need. Um, and one of the things I hope comes out to the panel is how much we can learn from them about what they need. And that'll hopefully be a theme that comes out as I talk today. Of like, There's some good programs out there and ones that Finland Pine Schools are using that integrate student voice and put them in leadership positions, which I think is really valuable. So I can't speak for students, but I can speak to my experience of working with them um, through elementary, I hope that former elementary and high school counselor. And as you all likely know, rates of anxiety and depression, rates of suicidal ideation, um, and attempts have been on the uptick even before COVID-19. And of course, COVID-19 exacerbated those challenges. The other thing I was reminded of too is that our communities in Central Oregon and our high desert aren't immune to these national things that are going on. And I just want to honor that we're on an almost one year anniversary of the Safeway shooting that directly impacted um, many people, probably likely in this room. Um, so I want to hold that. And the wildfires that are going on. So there's the human made um, and natural disasters that students are navigating, experiencing, and that's of course contributing to anxiety, depression, fear. And then on top of that, for our students of color or our LGBTQIA plus students, navigating environments that feel isolated, where they feel targeted, where they don't feel safe, just again, add to those stressors um, and can exacerbate those feelings of anxiety and depression. So I think it's really important to be holding the mental health concerns uh, right along with the topic. And I think I'll mention about what supports are available. Of course, I can speak from the school counseling perspective, so you'll kind of hear my plug for that. But we know through research that when mental health supports are available in schools, things like discipline concerns and safety concerns go down, and things like student achievement um, and graduation rates and success and attendance go up. And so one of the services available through school counselors is being able to do that prevention work and being able to provide counseling services and also being able to see where families and students need additional support, such as through programs I know Eric can talk about and some you too, Care Solace is a referral program that's in place. Thanks. Um, you know, something that you said that really struck me in the reporting for this article was that, um, you know, we're, we're, there's so many controversial issues that are impacting all of us throughout the country and it's so hard as a student to feel hopeful about the future and then you know care about pursuing your studies when all of this noise is happening in the background yeah and one last thing i'll mention is i think sometimes we imagine anxiety and depression in adolescents and, and children to look like how it shows up for us like maybe more withdrawn or silent but it actually can look like things like dealing with big feelings, feeling angry, short-tempered outbursts that can then get coded as discipline problems when really it's an opportunity to connect and provide support. Mm -hmm. um, Sonia, um, why are we seeing increasing impacts on students of color and students with disabilities? And how do you see um, solutions um, to that massive, massive issue? Yeah, and I think that's, um, thanks Taylor, I think that's important. One, just to realize that that question is very complex, multifaceted, so many different things come together in a perfect storm. Um, and also important to know that it's not just in our educational system. Um, all of our social constructs, institutions, and systems see those same disparities. Uh, and what we know about the research is that it's not because of differential behavior. Um, it's actually because of differential responses treatment of that behavior and so and for me there's lots of reasons why but one of the things I think is most important to focus on is the structural places um, that you know policies um, practices even resource distribution at the structural level is the most important to focus on um, we know that when we can tackle um, you know the way institutions operate regardless of whether or not there's people in them doing explicit you know biased behavior, they will still operate. Even if we're all changed hearts and minds, the, the organization still will operate as they have been. And part of where that comes from is when we have uh, institutions and organizations that have been built by and for one set of cultural values, then any other group or community that has a different set of values will fare worse in those systems. Um, and that's why we can see it across all systems. So, 
me, like focusing on you know things that we can change um, at the systemic level is where we see the most um, great outcomes. Like both um, Eric and, and Lucy have said, at all levels for all youth, not just youth of color or any other population group that's experiencing that disparity. Mm -hmm. Is that all of your questions? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, if we have, I think we have time. I would love to hear a bit about your work within the restorative justice. Yeah, um, so for me, I mean, some of the things that kind of can get us towards that, um, we know there's practices that uh, have been shown to work, um, and again, not just in, in educational systems. So, you know, restorative practices work. Um, it's actually a little bit more robust than just when harm has been created. There's lots of preventative stuff that can happen in restorative um, justice work, and also important for me to name that restorative justice, what we know as restorative justice, from indigenous communities from all around the world. Um, it's been borrowed and prepackaged and sometimes, um, you know, um, from Western cultures, but the idea behind it that still is relevant today, is as relevant as it was since time immemorial in indigenous communities is that we all belong. Mm -hmm. We all have value and if we operate with that lens, then that means we stand in relationship and we don't remove people from the community, whatever that community is. Why it's important to understand, you know, practices and techniques that start to foster that culture and that environment is because it's also not just for our young people; it's for us too. So for me, in my department, um, you know, we've been working on implementing restorative practices as a culture, and we haven't even got to what that looks like with young people because we're doing it with our staff, with each other. Um, how do we as adults model? young children now and it is a skill that can be used all the way up into adulthood because we all make mistakes we all get in arguments with people that we care about and we don't want those relationships to just end um, so it's yeah I really like it um, so let's see so this question's for everybody um, the impacts on the individual and community once a student is pushed out of school are incredibly significant um, how does you know this impact your work? How do you guys process this issue, um, Eric? Let's start with you. Yeah, um, thank you. We partner a lot with with Sonia and Lucy, and so whenever I hear you speak, I'm like, yes, I'm so grateful. And um, you know, I will say, I work a lot with with students when they're experiencing maybe an expulsion or something like a major uh, piece of discipline that occurs. But Laura Nordquist talked about this the other day. These restorative practices are a part of our disciplinary process, right? So. We are trying to build community and relationships as we interact with students when this occurs. And um, I've seen students, you know, be removed from schools, whether my time in Kauai or here, where they get expelled, and then I notice that they're experiencing homelessness down the road, right? And so that's a, a major impact of our community there too. 
Um, I can also remember a student I visited last year who had a lot of behavioral issues, but he and I got to work through a lot of restorative practices and you know reintegration, and he ended up in, in lockup in juvenile and um, talking to him on the basketball court in there, and, and just you know, at some point you know we're going to start making good choices, and you know he breaks down, and but he ended up getting to go back to school and now has a job and work toward his degree. And so if we can have these parameters and, and not have an absence of you know consequence for actions, but um, build our students' ability to kind of like grow from their mistakes because they're their children, right? Regardless of their age from kindergarten through 12th grade, um, this is our opportunity to help them gain skills so they can be functioning members of our community. Um, and so this this student is out there working, doing a good job now, and um, you know he's had he's hit him in the head with this restored conversation since seventh grade and. You know, hopefully it, it took now, so. Um, but just the more work we can do now can help our community down the road. Mm -hmm. um, I, I love that because when I was talking for, to one of the researchers for the article that I wrote, she really drove home the fact that the idea, the, the, the great uh, relationship between a teacher or a staff member at a school and a, and a student is the number one predictor of whether or not that student will succeed later in life uh, or throughout the school system. So that's Translation relationship. Yeah, relationships. Yes. Yeah, and I would just, I mean, add to that. I know originally um, the question was more to what happens with, you know, these students once they graduate. Eric and I were like, they don't graduate. Um, you know, the youth that we see referred to our department, most of the time they're pushed out and never reach graduation. And what we know uh, in the juvenile justice world is when young people are not connected to their school in a good way, that actually increases their likelihood to commit um, delinquency, uh, to make crime, commit crime. So that's actually a crime driving factor. And so we focus on that with all the youth that are referred to us that work with to try to get them reconnected with school um, in a meaningful way because that means they're less likely to create harm again or come um, back to us. So, but there, it also goes beyond, I mean, the research is very clear when youth are not able to be connected or successfully complete school, now we see outcomes, um, you know, that they're not entering the workforce. Um, even their uh, income, you know, probability goes down. Uh, more likely to enter our system, which then means in terms of the adult system. And so across almost every life, life uh, domain, you see that drop in them if they are not successful in, you know, their and then, of course, add intersectionality into that for um, youth of color, youth with disabilities, um, LGBTQIA plus community, and seven more. But that actually is the times ten. So. I, I think I'll just echo the theme of relationships and, and connection and, and thinking about how, um, I, I think this might lead into the next question about the role in schools. But I really feel like the schools truly are the heart of the community and they're where students spend sometimes the most consecutive time ever, right? And so, like, there's these really daunting facts that 80% of children and adolescents who need mental health support do not receive it, 80%. And of the 20% who are getting support and services, guess where they're getting them? Like, 75 to 80% of those folks are getting them from schools. So again, when we talk about, like, post-COVID, what happened, for two years, students were disconnected from some critical supports, not only from relationships with their friends and being able to kind of work through things. I mean, I have a seven-year-old. My colleagues got to hear a Zoom call cameo of him. But, um, you know, he, they need help. They don't just come into this world knowing how to work through conflict, to work through emotions and, like what I said, big feelings. I mean, we have such an opportunity to, in schools, be able to help them connect to who they are and their place in the world, um, but also these skills that are going to be needed. Like the same skills that are needed to be successful in careers and life are the same social emotional skills that we're trying to teach every day, right? We want to work with colleagues that care about us, that are empathic, that are kind, that can disagree with us kindly, um, and that's what we're, our hope for is for our youth as well. And our last question before we start, um, we open it up to the to the floor. Um, what do we need to do to change these outcomes? And this is open for everybody. Oh gosh. Um, <laughs> um, 
I would say from a basic standpoint, non-monetary um, is, is the, the focus on relationships and community, like um, valuing, you know, what, if your teacher, if your child's teacher calls, like let's have a, a partnership when that phone call happens. Um, let's understand that this is our opportunity to build relationships and community in our classrooms. And um, I grew up in this town, this town is growing, but this is our chance to kind of impact our community. And um, so for me, that's, that's what everything I think should be built off of. I would say locally, if we ever got to a point where we, as, as school districts, every school district in the county asked for more funding, I would highly encourage voters to, to consider that um, because the more people we can get in, more school counselors, more teachers, we can really help our students. And so um, for me, those would be the two things I would start with. Yeah, and I, I mean, I feel like we've mentioned some of the ways that we can do that, um, but I think, you know, it takes schools can't do it alone. Um, the juvenile department can't do it alone, right? I mean, so, and it's something, you know, that I think we have been doing really well in this community in a lot of different pockets. Um, but, you know, there's also, we can continue to do better. We can continue to go deeper and figure out how do we collectively um, look at, you know, policies and practices and procedures that have been around for a really long time and not be scared of the change. To lean into the discomfort of might be different than what we've been doing for hundreds of years and it's okay. Um, thank goodness we've, you know, we have uh, changed consistently. Uh, we just be here today, right? It's an example. So, like, lean into that discomfort, not be afraid of it. Um, and yes, we might fall on our faces and that's okay. That's actually good modeling for our young people. And then the only thing, other thing I would add is I, I also agree. I mean, young people and students need to be at the table and helping say really important, there is really good work happening and sometimes it happens in silos. And sometimes we don't really have forums or mechanisms to offer interprofessional perspectives. And so there's really good research about wraparound supports and, and being able to collaborate with families, communities, students to do the work. And of course I'll make a school counseling plug for that, that's me. Um, but you know, and, and it, me with facts and numbers, but they tell a story too, right? And so, you know, in, in Oregon, on average, there's one school counselor to 400 students. And the recommended ratio is one to 250. And so when we think about building connections, building relationships, implementing really positive curriculum, doing uh, individual and group counseling, we need more folks that are trained at the master's level, which school counselors are, to do prevention and intervention work. Um, so that's one thing I would recommend. And we know that there's barriers to pursuing graduate studies, and so we can talk about that, I think, a little bit, Taylor. But I will say that the Department of Education does recognize that mental health in schools is needed and necessary. So grant funding has been available, and we were able, my colleague, Dr. Moran, and I, to pursue that through OSU Cascades Counseling Program to help offset the cost of tuition for students who are uh, admitted and apply to that. And again, for my students that are out here, um, that are gonna do incredible work. Um, and so, I'll end there, awesome. Yeah, and what I love about this conversation so much is because it's, it's such a perspective shift because you know we look at a problem, right, and we just have such a negative connotation attached to problems, but what, what preventative discipline is says, okay, we have a problem, we have a student who is um, misbehaving, but fundamentally it, it uses that problem as an opportunity to do better. And it's that sense of optimism that I think that is so important when we have to look at um, in, in education. So that's really great. Um, thank you so much, guys. We're gonna open this up to um, questions from the audience. Um, so let's see here. So if you look on your tables um, and sign, um, let's see here. There uh, should be an information um, on how to submit questions um, from your phone and then those questions will pop up onto the my handy iPad here. Um, 
Um, so there are um, a large number of kids who act out and are the ones that don't feel included by other students. Um, are there ways to help kids um, all feel accepted? So if I'm re hearing that question correctly, so students that are maybe demonstrating behaviors that are acting out, not feeling included, can I see it up there? Mm, oh, yeah. Are they... or, or can you read it again? Yeah, for sure. Gotcha. Um, so sometimes a kid who is the one who's acting out, um, the one who's causing the misbehavior, might not feel included or welcomed by other students. Is there a way that we can proactively help um, foster those? Yeah, and, and that's kind of a big part of the, the, the issue to kind of address is you know, when harm is, is done in a classroom, right? Like a disruptive or explosive uh, incident. We want to make sure all the students in the classroom are safe, right? If there's a class of 30 students, 29 students are impacted by a, a big behavior or a big incident. Um, but we also get an opportunity to kind of help the student that was a part of that behavior, you know, grow their skills and, and be welcomed back to the classroom. Um, Sonia talked about the preventative work we can do with when we think about restorative practices. And um, if a teacher or a school is setting up their classroom to be a community, right, there will hopefully be mechanisms in place to say, hey, if you know, if we don't meet the the requirements of our community or these agreed upon norms we have in our classroom, here's how we're going to respond, right? Uh, it's not going to be shame-based, it's not going to be, um, you know, targeted necessarily fully toward that student, but we are a community, this event happened in our classroom, here's how we're going to respond to that. And, um, you know, we need to make sure there's training available so teachers feel comfortable doing that in the classroom individually. Um, and we have resources, we have Amber McGill from High Desert ASD who does a lot of trainings for our district in restorative practices. And, but yeah, it just goes back to that relationship to community piece because, you know, as Sonia also talked about, big incidents happen in our community as well, and we need to move forward as a, a collective. So, can I can I add on to that? Please. Like, yeah. I think I'll maybe attach to the part about how to like facilitate that connection and belonging and inclusion, and I think we can pay attention to school climate data and you know, youth truth survey data, and I've seen good examples, for instance, of school members who look at those surveys and think, who are the students that are impacted or feel isolated, and how can we identify that and then use curriculum. So going in and delivering curriculum, there's some really important ones that are being utilized within the Lapine and in Redmond, um, things like Character Strong that are teaching students skills, and also figuring out from them what they'd like to see. So I'll make a little plug. Sources of Strength, I've never met with anyone. They do not pay me, um, but I, really love the program because it embeds student voice. So for instance, it's used in middle and high schools and one thing that they do is use student campaigns. So they use student leaders that are then going out and figuring out like, what do we need? Where are there relationships that need to be fostered? What kind of community clubs or events can we have uh, to support students in fostering connections with one another? Um, so our, our next question is Good, I like this question. Um, I hear about students in classrooms using their cell phones. Do teachers have a right to ban the use of cell phones? I think I'll probably get most of it. Um, so, um, so yeah, so we, as a secondary team, so we have our level leaders for secondary here as well, is we're agreeing this year to have cell phones be silent in a way. So um, you know, the expectation moving forward is that cell phones will be in students' pockets or in their locker, um, and then we're gonna have you know, follow-ups to that accordingly. Because uh, you know, majority of our students are maybe having a cell phone, bringing those to school. Uh, we don't want them being distracted by those devices. And um, a lot of investigations um, involve cell phone use. Students can be bullied or harassed on their cell phones. There's a lot of access to inappropriate things on there, and so there's an educational component that we uh, get the opportunity to work through with our students. Like these devices are here, right? And so we can't just blindly say no and never talk about them again. But it's up to us to partner with parents and help educate our students. But we're uh, moving forward, uh, having those be a way, and we can focus on being present in the classroom when you're in the classroom. So I think that's a perfect question, and um, I'll never get my kids a cell phone when they're mad at me, but I'll see what happens. <laughs> and I'm not in the classroom, um, so I'm not going to speak to the right to teachers do that. But also, what I will say is this is where, as just general society, modeling is really important yeah. because we don't model that behavior for our young people at all. <laughs> Maybe in some uniform instances, but so you know, I thought also there's there's so much more to it than just the school environment and the behavior. You know, the societal factors, and as you mentioned earlier, are so important. Just keep that in mind. Like something else we can do as adults is also start modeling the behavior we expect young people in the school. Or any, in any other setting. Mm -hmm. Putting 
the putting the cell phones away at family dinner, you know, just small things like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Starting small. <laughs> Baby steps. Um, so, um, what are teachers meant to do when they encounter violence in classrooms? Yeah. Um, as long as I've been in education, right there, there are rare instances where there's a, a fight or a, you know, kind of a, a big incident like that. So we need to prioritize the safety of the, the students and the teachers in that incident um, and make sure administration can respond. We have a partnership with SROs and police officers that are in the majority of our secondary schools. And, um, yeah, for me, it's a safety. That's a safety issue, and we can move from there. But um, yeah, that, I mean, that's the same as I would tell anyone that if something dangerous or violent is happening, we're going to have a plan to be safe and, and keep the teachers and the students safe. So how do you, um, when we're talking about um, student discipline, how do we make sure that parents are stakeholders and are present in this um, conversation? How do, we, how do we bring them into um, discussions within schools? I'll say this, I've loved all the, this would probably be my favorite question. Um, we, we just launched our kind of welcome back for all our administrators and really highlighted the importance of communicating well not only with our teachers, right? So if a teacher has a conversation with an administrator about a student that's needing support in the classroom, we want to make sure the teacher is fully engaged in that conversation because they're going to continue to work with that student. But another kind of tenet of our, our goal with our schools and our administration this year is our parents know their children better than all of us, and our parents deserve to be communicated with. Um, and and our, our parents like, are the life of our kids, right? And so if we don't communicate well with our parents, we're never going to be successful. And so all the training and communication that we'll have with our administration and those who interact with parents, uh, it's really a prioritization of that. And, and I'm a bit of a broken record right now with that relationship and community piece. It's not impactful if we don't like, respect and honor our parents and, and talk to them about their children. Uh, and so anytime an incident occurs or something happens, we're, we're wanting that communication to occur with parents in a partnership, right? Um, this occurred, these are some of the ways we typically respond. This is what we're hoping to do to help your student, um, you know, let's make a plan from there. Like that would be a wonderful way to have those conversations because they're uncomfortable, right? Your child may have gotten in trouble or had something happen at school or your child may have witnessed something, right? Like we need to reach out to all impacted parties and really respect and honor our parents. Mm -hmm.
to reciprocal communication too of how can we customize our approaches to be more reflective of how things are being talked about at home. Um, Lucy, I'm going to give this question over to you because I know we had a really awesome conversation when we talked for the article. Uh, how are screens affecting students and their ability to regulate and learn? <laughs> In all seriousness, I think if we think about that we can be experienced trauma from witnessing an event firsthand, obviously, but now in our phones and in our hands, we can re-experience that over and over. And the thing that's different about that is that when you go on social media, you can't anticipate what's gonna come up. So you're not prepared always to engage with that content, and then it's designed to have you engage more and more and more. And we um, often aren't really aware, like, what are the, how, how are students experiencing that? How are we talking to them about what they're seeing? And, and so I'm just talking about just exposure to trauma and how that can happen over and over again. Not even to think about the pressures on our children and adolescents to conform to what they see, this idealized version of themselves I can't imagine what it's like to always be thinking about my content I'm sharing and whether it's how many likes I'm getting and, and what that means for my uh, self-esteem and self-confidence, um, not to mention when you're trolled or attacked. I mean, this is brutal stuff that students are encountering um, and at younger and younger ages. Yeah, I saw this um, headline you know, a couple weeks ago that was like, it took social media algorithm like a matter of minutes to be able to go down this wormhole of like this really graphic content that children should not be exposed to. Um, so thank you for, for touching on that. Um, question for Eric. Um, can you briefly describe any trauma-informed training that school teachers and um, administrators receive? Um, I'm going to blank on this one. Um, so we, you know, a lot of our work in restorative practices in, um, we have a lot of Yeah, so, yeah, well, I mean, I just put Amber on the spot here, but um, we, we, we have all these partnerships in the community, and, and, and I'll highlight Amber's here, but Amber works with the High Desert ESD and the Culture Care Group, and they'll come into schools and do trauma-informed kind of lessons or walkthroughs with, with staff for a variety of topics. Um, when, when we have our administrators and school staff sign up for the restorative practice work, it's all trauma-informed, and so we really, based on resources, right, like our teachers are asked so much, we would love to give targeted training in so many different areas to our teachers and right now a lot of our focus with these kind of partnerships we build up our administration so they can bring those into staff meetings and bring those into the professional development offered at the, the school sites so there's tons of partnerships that we have that are kind of rooted in trauma-informed uh, work and practices so um, so yeah highlight amber right here and amber would be much more eloquent on this if, if she could so. Um, so yeah this is a question for you really interesting um so what this person is asking is when um, students of color are able to have um, staff members and educators that work with them and having greater numbers of um, people of color who work in schools, um, does the discipline rate tend to change at all? Um, you know, I don't, I don't know that I could cite any specific correlation, but what mm -hmm. we do know, again, across multiple settings, is when we see ourselves represented in the spaces,
couple more questions. Um, this is really interesting, um, and probably Eric, I think, would be the best um, person to answer this. How do you balance the learning needs of the entire class with the individual needs of, uh, of a student who might be misbehaving? Yeah, and this is kind of the, the most nuanced part of this whole process, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and as we've listened to our, our staff members and our teachers, this is, I, I hear this often from teachers, right? They're working so hard to create a lesson design instruction for all students, right? And there are, even when I, I remember doing observations last year, I would watch it and be like, I could never be a classroom teacher. It's so difficult to support the student that needs your attention right now to keep everyone engaged. Um, so, so that's why I think I led with, I think teaching is re remarkably difficult. Um, and we have to have that balance, right? And so going back to that, if we can have a way to reintroduce students after you know, harm has been done in the classroom, we can definitely setting up our systems and our structures, you know, having a predictable structure in the classroom is kind of you know, trauma-informed way to do that. Um, but just, you know, these positive and strong teaching practices that all our administrators work with our teachers on, setting up our classroom for success is, is the best way to do that in that preventative sense. Um, and then having a way to respond based on the structures you put in place first. So just, just that preventative work and, and, you know, knowing your kids and knowing your With restorative practices, um, you know, in some of the videos that I've watched, and this isn't even response to behavior, but you know, when there's a mindfulness check-in at the beginning where young people, young children, even middle school, high school are able to just check in and get some sort of weather report, here's how I'm showing up today, and they do that in community, um, that fosters their environment. Also the use of effective questions or effective statements this it makes me feel this way right um, that's kind of you know some of the preventative stuff that we're talking about um, but also the, you know we have this notion um, in mainstream society and I you know and I see it in the young people we work with is when somebody does act up in a setting that everyone just stops and waits for the adult or the teacher to handle it it's we don't see it as oh this is we're going to deal with this together we had an incident we're going to pause and we as a community, whether that's a classroom or you know, whatever setting, we're going to pause and figure out what's going on, how do we support you? Um, and it sounds like, you know, the North Star, but I've, I've seen it, I've seen it, it's amazing. Awesome. Okay, so I think we're gonna move to our last question here. So what can we do to support teachers, students, and schools? Big question. <laughs> yes. I'm glad they're going after me because it's like, I'll do a basic and a much better answer. Um, I, I would just go back to the beginning and, 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 and that's why I think this is a valuable, I didn't know much about City Club before and I was terrified and like, oh, who are you yelling? Um, but I think just, engaging in this, this level of discourse at this level, and I think Taylor did a wonderful job in the bulletin story of having this really well-researched topic, right, and, and not going for this or that. And so if we can just exist together on this path and, and value all viewpoints on both sides, um, I think that's a great way to do this, and I think this is a, a proper venue to start that. Um, and, and I would love for my last words to be like, I, I really think working in schools and the people that work with children every day is the hardest job in the world, and so I just would love for us to just always know that and even with our school board leaders that are here too right unpaid positions helping give us guidance um, i just think the more we can treat people with with, with honor and dignity and, and understand that people are working really hard to help um, i think we can you know, forge a positive growth together so
preschool available and like child care available to everyone who needs it because young children need the foundation of good attachment, good relationships and environments where they're cared for and they get these experiences when they go into school, supporting schools, supporting teens, I'll echo the same thing. It is the hardest job. Like many people in this room have been there, but many people who make decisions or who vote haven't been there to see what happens on the day to day. And children and adolescents are always showing us what they need. It may not be in the way we would love for them to, but they are always showing us what they need. We talk a lot about what we do today is for the seventh and the seventh generation. Um, very similar to your quote, but and and for me, like everyone who is showing up to create environments and spaces where young people are supported and included, um, that's the work that that they're doing. Uh, and so, you know, for me, my, it's funny my brain goes to like all oh, these tangible things that you can do. And so, for me, I was just thinking of like. You know, creating spaces where the intersection of conversations can happen. Um, because, you know, I mean, teachers and anyone working with young people need to be able to, you know, need the spaces and the structures that support them to do these things we're talking about. It's really easy to say it. It's a whole other thing to set up systems and structures that support that. Um, but creating spaces where everyone that belongs in the communities we're talking about gets to say, here's what here's what I need to be successful. Um, and that we listen and we go to work um, on changing the, the structures that are pre preventing that right now. Well, sweet. Well, thank you guys so much for participating in the panel. And thank you for everybody who um, asked questions and thanks for coming today. I'm going to bring Kim back on stage real quick. <laughs> to our panel, Lucy, Sonia, Eric, and Taylor, um, for leading us in conversation today. Uh, in our planning meetings, one idea really uh, uh, struck with me, and that was that part of the solution to these behavioral issues that we are seeing in our schools is focusing on how students can be better communicators and better at problem solving. And all I can think is how much we need more of that, better communicating and better problem solving together and that our communities and organizations like City Club need our next generation of leaders to have those skills in order to continue to hold conversations like this. And it brought me a lot of hope that we're instilling that um, in the next generation and that we can continue to have discussions like this as, as they become our leaders. Uh, we had some very specific questions um, that came in um, through Minty for City Club, so um, some materials and that sort of thing. So if you had a specific question that we obviously didn't ask the panel, please feel free just to, to go ahead and contact me at City Club. Um, you'll get an email from me later today, too, that you can respond to. Our next forum is September 21st. We'll be at Tethero Resort, um, and this forum is on Psilocybin 101 and how um, psilocybin treatment is going to impact Central Oregon and Bend in particular. Registration is now open for members and will open up for non-members on August 28th. We do expect um, this forum to sell out pretty quickly, um, so go ahead and sign up as early as you as you can. If you're not a member, uh, please take time to consider joining. Our organization only exists with the support of our members and sponsors. Thank you so much for joining us today and to be willing to enter into conversation about uh, difficult topics. Thank you. <laughs>